Welcome to Cryptoland. I'm Krishna Undavolu. Today we're talking about crypto wallets and how being your own bank could mean losing your own money. Being your own bank is still a central idea to what crypto culture is, and there are a lot of risks that come with it. But what does that really look like, and why would anyone want to do it? Here to talk about it are motherboards Janice Rose and co-founder of Satoshi Labs, Pavel Rusnak. Thank you both for joining me today. Uh, lots of money has been lost because crypto keys and wallets have been lost. To understand why this is a problem, how this is a problem, how it actually works, can you guys explain to me like exactly what a crypto wallet is, exactly what a crypto key is, why it's central to the technology of cryptocurrency itself, and how that you know, can pose a problem if you end up losing the key? I guess I'll start with you, Janice. Yeah, so basically, a crypto wallet is basically just a secure piece of software that um, stores not Bitcoins themselves or cri cryptocurrency or anything like that, but stores a key, which basically points to a spot on the blockchain, which is the public ledger that cryptocurrencies use. And then that key is then used to access the funds that are in that particular part of the blockchain. And basically, the there's two basically types of crypto wallets. There are crypto wallets that are managed by remote sources, like something like Coinbase or like a service that manages wallet for a, for, a wallet for you. And then there's also um, individual wallets that are sort of like programs that you keep on your phone or your computer. And those are kind of like non-custodial wallets that um, basically allow you to store your keys on a device that you control, mm -hmm. which sort of limits the ability for you to lose those funds if something goes wrong, but it also depends on you to like keep that wallet secure. So Pavel, can you explain to me then what the key actually is? Like, what does it look like? Is it a, a bunch of bits? Is it a physical key? No, obviously not. Yeah, right. It, it's not a physical key. You can imagine the, the security key called private key or secure key as just a big number. It's a number that is 100 or 200 letters. And what we do in the computer security is we take this private number and we use some operation to create a, a corresponding number or, 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 or two-dimensional point that's called a public key. What happens in the Bitcoin blockchain during the mining is that a miner creates a, a template which uh, contains their address where the newly mined coins are being sent to. And only the miner knows the private key, uh, which is corresponding to this public key. So it makes sense they can spend these coins only by proving uh, they own this public key uh, by uh, performing the sign operation using the private key they have. Okay, so then the issue then, what are, what are people actually losing then? Are they losing this private key? Like when, when someone says lost Bitcoin, what of these two elements are they actually losing? Yeah, they're, they're losing the private key. They're, they're losing access. They're losing that element that is enabling them to prove that they own that, um, that wallet, that, that source of funds. So basically, that is what, like, like what Pavel was saying, it's just this long string of numbers, and that is used to basically like unlock this this group of funds. So if you lose access to that, there you no longer have a way to cryptographically prove that you are the owner or the person in control of that funds. It sounds like a nightmare. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also a nightmare that is kind of baked into some of the foundational ideology of what cryptocurrencies are, which is like you rely on yourself to hold this currency. It's not backed by a government. It's not a bank. It's, it's yours. So explain to me, I guess, from the technical side to the ideological side, like these two things, it's, it's risky, but it's also inherent to what crypto is, right? Yeah, I can, I can explain it for, probably from the ideological side the best. Um, but yeah, like essentially, like Part of the whole idea with cryptocurrency um, when it was originally put into a white paper was this idea of decentralizing um, this ac access to this like sort of monetary system. And basically what that involves is like having something that's publicly auditable. So the blockchain, which is like something that everyone can see. Mm -hmm. So you can prove that you access that you have access to certain funds. But it also involves removing that sort of centralized authority, like a bank. That can uh, with, that can sort of withhold access to funds, that can like deny transfers, that can do all these other things. And so, 
part of like what's going on with when, when you deal with wallets is that you're basically taking full control over your own, your own money, so to speak. And in order to do that, you also have to take responsibility over the security of the private key. And in, in order to do that, you need to like adopt some practices that are going to perhaps be kind of annoying and burdensome. Yeah. But like ultimately, that's kind of the exchange that you make in exchange for not having a sort of centralized authority that can kind of just revoke access to um, funds that you have. And the complementary exchange that we would make in a traditional banking or monetary system is for the comfort of knowing that we can't lose our money, we divest the authority to cancel that money. So like the government can say that money doesn't exist anymore. Right. In the well, traditional sense. But in this sense, they can because you hold it. Yeah, you can't lose your money in certain ways. <laughs> and then in other ways, you can still lose it. Um, if, you know, if like, for example, you are um, a sex worker and you are, you know, determined by PayPal does this all the time where, you know, PayPal being like sort of a very centralized authority um, in terms of like, you know, online transactions and very frequently uh, sex workers and people who um, uh, work in like the sex industry are denied access to um, their funds if they are found to be in violation of terms of service. So in a sense, like, yes, like putting your money into a, like a traditional bank does secure it against some threats. It, does, it secures it against, you know, losing it, um, some people, some, somebody robbing your house, you know, something like that. But in, the, in another sense, it doesn't prevent against um, like government intervention or state intervention in that way. I want to talk about the best practices then because losing it sounds like a, a nightmare. But before that, there's like a statement that I've heard before, like, not your key, not your coin. Is that sort of like a statement of like, if you're not holding the actual private key yourself, then foundationally, you're not actually holding that coin. The coin is being held by a third party. Yeah, you might log into a Coinbase or whatever with a password and two-factor authentication. But if you don't have the key, and if you're not the only person with that key, then it's not really your coin. Yeah, I think maybe Pablo can speak more about this, but I think that speaks back to the old ex the old Linux expression, which is like if you're uh, you know if you're using the cloud, you're just using somebody else's computer. So in this case, you're using not only someone else's computer, but someone else's computer that's acting as a bank for you. So um, if your wallet is stored on a remote server somewhere and you don't have access to that key, or if someone else is sharing access to that key, then effectively like you can't say for certain that you have like complete control over that wallet. And Pavel, how, did, how does that relate to wallets and the different kinds of wallets that there are? Yeah, I, I think Janice captured it uh, very nicely that uh, if, if you are not in, in, in full custody of your uh, private key, then you are not in full custody of your coins and you are not using the power that Bitcoin gives you in, in, in full potential because uh, all of the facts we mentioned earlier that the government can cost, confiscate your money, it's still there. They have a leverage over these companies, uh, the centralized exchanges to, to, to basically pull uh, the keys from them and spend your coins. And that's not something you would probably know. You probably won't, sorry. And uh, being your own bank, as like like you said, uh, and, or being self-sovereign, it's it's a pretty complex topic. But I think it's uh, really worth uh, doing. I might come back to, later to it. But what we what we do is we try to address this self-sovereignty by balancing three key areas. And for me, uh, self-sovereignty is uh, combining security and privacy together. And in order for that to work, you also have uh, to have a solution that is usable enough because you are competing on a market where there are traditional banks which are usable and reasonably secure, but they are not private at all. And uh, on the other hand, you have all these custom setups by hardcore Bitcoiners which are private and reasonably secure, but not really usable for mainstream like your grandparents, for example. And uh, this is something uh, we try to balance. This is the area where we, uh, as the producers of hardware wallets, uh, operate. And I think that if we tackle this topic and we provide a solution that has best of all worlds, then we can onboard uh, millions of people into Bitcoin while mitigating all the issues uh, you mentioned earlier at least in some reasonable manner. Well, let's take a step back then, because 
yes, how would my grandparents or my uncle or me, frankly, generally like get a Bitcoin, then store a Bitcoin and then access that Bitcoin? Like what is like the, the you know, what are the majority of people actually doing? Well, what majority of people do is using decentralized exchanges because they are very user-friendly. You can use credit cards, you can use uh, wire transfer to get your coins. You're talking about and your I Coinbase, don't think is, that, that's, is that right? Right, right. And I don't think that's necessarily bad, but uh, you have to be aware of all these risks, risks we mentioned. And uh, if you are not comfortable uh, um, losing all that money, maybe you should just pull them off the exchange into a self-sovereign or a non-custodial wallet. And this is where uh, solutions like Trezor come into play. And when we when, when we were creating a hardware wallet at the beginning, we, uh, we well, didn't before, realize... What is provided... tell, uh, Pavel, tell me what yeah. is Treasure and like how does it... Because it's like yeah. a custodial wallet yeah. versus a non-custodial wallet. It's a fancy way of saying, does Coinbase hold your wallet and key and do you just log into it and then that's an easy user experience? But then there's like the Wild West of like you have mm -hmm. your key hidden in your home somewhere and you hope to God you don't lose it. Yeah. So is Trezor trying to, you know, be some, somewhere in the middle where you get best of both worlds? So, uh, yeah, like I said earlier, there are two opposites of the spectrum. On the one hand, you have this custodial solution, which are super, super usable and user friendly. On the other hand, you have these custom setups which are private and secure, but not very usable. And we're trying to find this sweet spot by introducing a non-custodial wallet, which means you are in the full possession of your keys. And uh, in the beginning, uh, we didn't really think that we need to make a hardware wallet. And we tried to create a software wallet, which would be a nice sweet spot. But we realized it's very hard. It's very hard because uh, common people are not really good at uh, securing their computers, are not good at securing their phones. And we realized we need to create a specialized type of hardware called hardware wallet, which is able to isolate all these uh, private keys, this sensitive data from the environment that can be compromised, such as your computer connected to the internet. And as a nice side effect was that suddenly some people, for example, elderly, they had this physical, tangible thing in their hand, which made it a little bit easier for them to grasp how Bitcoin works. Because they think the Bitcoin is stored in the hardware wallet and we know it's not true, it's only the private key. But the feeling that you have to protect this at all costs is very real. So Treasure is like a hardware wallet, which is to say it's an object. You've made an object. Yeah, yeah, yes, we did. We, we made an electronic object. Well, that's interesting because it's like we're talking about this extremely complicated crypto, cryptographic software thing. And like, yeah, you just need an object to make it tangible. You said the word grasp. They, like people can grasp what this technology is. It's like it is really hard to grasp it because it is in the ether. And so the security problems and losing Bitcoin is like literally because where is it? I, I don't know where it is. So like there's a physicality to it I find pretty interesting. Yeah, the, having the wallet be a physical object I think does um, create a lot of usability that didn't exist before um, because I, I do think that like, you know, you could sit here and explain it to, you know, uh, like a person who is not technically inclined uh, for an hours. <laughs> um, or you could uh, create something that they can more easily relate to. And I think that is the challenge always when it comes to technology and making it more accessible. Okay, so this is a cool solution that, we're, that you're developing. And obviously, like, we're in this amazing period where all these solutions are being worked on by the, the community of, of people in crypto. But take me back, like, how did people actually lose Bitcoin? Was it as simple as, like, forgetting? If, if you're self-custodying your own keys and it's in a private wallet, how do you actually lose it? I'll start with you, James. Yeah, with a lot of people, um, it just means, like, your device gets lost or fails in some way. Like, if you have your private key stored on your cell phone, for example, um, and you lose your cell phone, 
that is, that's it. That's, that was the key. That's why um, what Pavel was saying about the, the seeds, which are um, something that, that's a mechanism that was started for a lot of software wallets also, where if you change devices and you forget to back up your, um, your wallet um, before you change devices, you just need to remember those like 12 words, those randomly generated words, and then it can regenerate the wallet on a new device. So that's like another example of like a safety measure because a lot of times it will just be a person for whatever reason losing access to the device that's storing the private key. So once that happens, if you don't have a way of backing it up, then it's just gone. Right, and I mean, the, the number 20% is a lot. Like if you think about what Bitcoin is valued at now, like if 20% of it is estimated to have been lost in some way, there's like a treasure trove just out there waiting to be found, right? Like it's it's like buried treasure. Yeah, but it's treasure that no one can ever access ever um, <laughs> because basically it's just sitting there. It's on the blockchain, it's sitting there. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a computational accounting for this money existing, but because the private key has been lost, unless you recover that private key, it's just gonna sit there and be inert forever. So now it's interesting because we're in this era again of like hyper technology, but I imagine some of the ways people lose the keys are rather low tech, whether it's I lost my phone or I didn't think it was that valuable, so I didn't like really give a shit about it. Fast forward, you know, seven to eight years and it's gone up tenfold or more. Like, and I imagine people like are scammed out of it too. Like, can we talk about like stories of how people have lost their their key, their Bitcoin that are like legendary in the world of crypto? Yeah, I think there's a lot of examples. Like, I mean, one of the sort of like prime examples is like people who have their wallets stored on, you know, exchanges, because you're basically like, like we were saying before, you're entrusting the exchange to basically be a bank for you. And there have been countless um, hacking incidents where, you know, exchanges have been compromised, keys have been compromised. And what happens at that point is just like, you know, those, those, those coins are just lost because whoever is breaking into the system and gains control of those keys, if you're entrusting it to someone else, then you're also entrusting them to keep those things secure. So that's like one of the most common ways, I think, that a lot of this, these coins become lost. And then, yeah, a lot of it is just devices failing, losing, like having it written down somewhere, like the, the, your, your seed or your key written down somewhere, yep. like physically a piece, piece of paper, yep. and then just like losing it. Like it's a number of ways that this could happen. So what you're talking about basically is if I have my wallet and private key stored on a system like Coinbase, I have a username and a password to get in there. Maybe it's two-factor, but who, you know, maybe it's not two-factor, right? And maybe someone just did a phishing attack and found what my commonly used passwords are and just like, hey, tried it out. Like, that sounds pretty easy, actually. It sounds like it would happen all the time. It's happened before and it will happen again. <laughs> um, Pavel, do you know any stories of people losing their Bitcoin or like people trying to find it? Isn't there someone who had like $280 million or something like looking for it? Yeah, I mean, these stories happen all the time. And uh, there are also some nice, uh, nice stories or stories with uh, nice outcomes. For example, a person have thought they lost their recovery seat, but seven years later, when they are switching the apartments, they, and they were moving the furniture and found it somewhere behind the sofa or something <laughs> like that. So it was a really, really nice surprise. And you might have read the story about the guy who threw away their hard drive and then uh, they were uh, trying to figure out where it ended, uh, in which land landfill it ended in, and started to dig uh, there. I don't think he was successful, but yeah, th these crazy stories happen all the time. Th that said, I want to stress out that uh, I think that these uh, risks can be reasonably mitigated. And uh, of course, uh, solutions like hardware wallets are showing you some guides what to do, that you should write down your security seat uh, and you should store it in secret location. And I think the point here is not doing this when you are stressed so you can follow the instructions in fully. And uh, if you do that properly, uh, then there is a really huge chance that uh, you just won't mess up because it's it's really easy. You just have to be uh, in a position to follow these uh, instructions. The situation is a little bit different when you are using some custodial solutions such as Exchange because then you are basically out of luck. If somebody screws up on their part, then it's your coins you are losing. So... 
so that's 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 a trade off. And uh, what I wanted to add is that Bitcoinization is a long process, and we need to be constantly educating people about what are the options and what are the risks of these options. What does it take to to put these two things together? Because like part of me thinks of this as like a really old fashioned problem, like you lost your keys, or you know the safe in your house isn't strong enough. You have to rely on yourself. And then we built this whole like structure and system about how like okay you have to rely on yourself, but we've got banks, we've got the FDIC to ensure those deposits because we don't want that to go away. We've got police officers to help you if things go wrong. Like there's a whole way of a whole system of the world designed to protect your property. And now we're sitting around a table being like, oh, there's a new kind of property. It's called Bitcoin and our keys. But we need to build a whole different kind of system in order to secure it. You see what my point? Like, it's it it it's both interesting and bizarre. But does it have to be this complicated? I guess is the is the the question. Right. I mean, you know, the system the system that's ensuring that you have access to your property. It's important to note is is something that is works better for some people than for others. Sure. And I think it's very important in all these discussions to note that like those systems were not created to be enforced equally and that some people are always going to be disadvantaged by banking systems. Um, Let's pick up on that. Give me yeah. some examples because I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. There's a whole there's a whole population of unbanked people, what they call unbanked people who don't have access to bank accounts whether it's because of, you know, not having a stable address, being homeless, um, all these other factors that can contribute to someone just not fitting into the mold that you know our society creates that like says this is what you need to do in order to be worthy of like having access to a bank account and you know having access to all these other things like being able to get a loan you know all of these all of these things are constructed in such a way that benefit some groups more than others so i think that's always an important point and what you're actually talking about here when it comes to um cryptocurrency and like you're you're shifting risk like you're taking you're taking assumed risk and you're just shifting it from one cent- central sort of location to another and so you are taking on a lot of risk um as like a thing like you have to be responsible in a way that you might not have to be responsible if you just entrusted your funds to a bank when you have a like a hardware wallet or a software wallet but at the same time you know that other system doesn't work for everyone so it makes sense that there's this other option but at the same time um in order to get that to work it does require a lot of changes in habits um people need to much in the way that people had to learn about you know just general security like internet security passwords um passwords have a very kind of analogous problem here where there are password managers because it's not you know advisable to have the same password mm-hmm. and use the same password for everything and so in that case in the same way as the custodial wallets that we were talking about you are entrusting that sort of like company or app to secure access to your passwords and you know they can say like oh we encrypted it we did all this other stuff but ultimately you're you're entrusting that their technology is going to be able to um defend the valuable data so in the same it's the same thing mm-hmm. it's this shifting of responsibility and part of that shift in responsibility uh comes with benefits but it also comes with needing to change your habits and understand sort of like what is necessary in order to um sort of secure this these sort of digital assets. Pavel, can you can you speak to like, you know, I I'm sitting here in the United States like I'm pretty like, you know, I've got some a decent amount of trust that the government isn't going to like screw me over tomorrow. I have a lot of privilege. However, that like there's a lot of different places where the vast majority of people might have that fear often and that's why when we think about crypto and we think about self um custodianship right self custodianship these two things are very interesting necessary and cutting edge i i think if we are talking about the risks we should also talk about the rewards and that's where the discussion is heading right now uh i think that everyone should have the right to to perform their money transactions in private because we right now we are living in a polarized world where one groups uh, one group is trying to take advantage of the other and if we are not able to transact money privately then we lose the ability to defend ourselves and i think i could just stop here right now but let me give you some examples uh 
Janice already mentioned the unbanked people and these can can be living also in the US. They don't have to live in the third world countries, but it's much more common in their area, of course. And uh, one, one example is also remittance. Uh, companies like Western Union are taking huge cut, cut when you are transacting uh, between the third world countries. And this makes poor countries even more poor. And these countries usually don't have international trade because they do not have a common currency. And if they adopted Bitcoin, they would solve uh, two issues with uh, one thing. They would have a uh, common currency and they would cut off, cut off the middleman. So their remittance problem would just go away or at least would be much, uh, much, uh, much smaller. One of the uh, other advantage uh, that uh, we can gave, gain from using Bitcoin is getting rid of uh, age restriction where you have very skillful developers out there who are only 13 and they are not able to earn money by offering their services because they can't just open their account at the, at the banks. Another use case is, for example, microtransactions where with the current financial system, it's very impractical to pay small amounts because usually when you have a processor like payment or v uh, PayPal or Visa, they want to have at least, I don't know, minimum 30 cent uh, per, paid for per transaction. So it's uh, very impractical to pay one cent. With Bitcoin, it is suddenly possible and you can build crazy stuff like, for example, a streaming service where a viewer will pay for every second uh, just a t tiny fraction of money, which can eventually lead to more fair service. I think it is actually really interesting, which is um, we've identified a lot of people who would benefit from a Bitcoin because uh, there isn't like a regime holding their feet over the fire. They're um, independent in some ways. The remittances won't get charged a, uh, a service fee. But it also strikes me that just generally as the world works, like the more privilege you have, the more access you have to security, period, right? And if I had, let's say, a hardware wallet and I didn't have like my own house or I shared my house with, you know, three or four other people and those three or four other people switch around every once in a while, or if I don't have a house and I move, I tend, you know, from, from different place to place to work, like the actual chances of losing it are much higher Versus, you know, I'm like a pretty stable rich person and I have a house that I just, it's mine and no one else lives there. I have a room where I can put it in a safe. I have events around my house and I have, I'm in a gated community. So like, I see what you're saying about the opportunity of Bitcoin to give the less privileged an aspect of autonomy and self-sovereignty, but the security question and then the possibility of losing it is actually more bad for those who are less privileged. So I think that, was, that would be my pushback against what I'm hearing from you. I'm sure there's a solution or people are thinking about it because that the, the physical fact of like, the richer you are, the easier it is for you to secure stuff has been true forever. But what, yeah, what do you say to that? Because I think that it just, it's going through my head right now. Yeah, I think that's a, actually a really good point. And I think that is something I would even extend further into like when we're talking about privacy and like the privacy that's being afforded to you by using cryptocurrency. I think that like with any technology, regardless of whether it's cryptocurrency or something else, like there's always a need to recognize that like the privilege that already exists is more or less going to remain the same unless it is designed explicitly to help um, those who are less less privileged. So like that example that you're giving about like, yeah, a rich person will have like a large house where they're in a gated community and like their token will be more secured than another person. But then in another sense also, when you're talking about a lot of these cryptocurrency systems, like what you're effectively saying, and this is also like with like NFTs and like, you know, a lot of people are hailing NFTs as like this new sort of like speculative asset. But like, you know, when we think about it, like what does this do aside from give rich people another speculative asset to hide their money in. There are a lot of ways that these systems will um, potentially um, benefit people who are unbanked, who are you know, disadvantaged in some way. But I think it's also important to note that there are people who are already advantaged 
that will always be using the sort of like privacy and like relative anonymity in some cases to their advantage to continue uh, manipulating money and making more money and hoarding money in the same way that they always do. So like, I think that it sort of cuts both ways in that way. Mm -hmm. And so Pablo, the question is to you then, like if you're making a hardware wallet that is effectively something you can grasp, how do you design that for a worker who goes from Florida then to California, maybe shares you know, living spaces with multiple people, different people at different times. Like, do you just, you know, implant it in their bodies or something? Like, what, what, what is the way that in those use cases, like, how are you thinking that stuff through? Because I think if we're going to go on the argument yeah. that Bitcoin's really, really good for giving access to the underprivileged to a better, beggar, a better banking system, then security, losing that Bitcoin or having it stolen from you in some fashion is actually more important. Right. I mean, you can totally have uh, a security key implanted in your body. I have a chip in my hand, but I only use that to open the doors. <laughs> so, but that's not to that's not totally mainstream uh, mainstream uh, thing you would recommend to all people. And uh, you can also memorize the recovery seat. It's only twelve words, yeah. but I wouldn't recommend it for long-term use because um, memory works in quite peculiar way and then you might be sure that you know the words correctly but you don't and there are cases where people were able to cross borders by memorizing these words so there are use cases for a so-called brain wallet but I am rec I'm not recommending them for long-term use of course uh, you can hide your recovery seat somewhere in the public, maybe in the public park or something like that, but that's also somebody can see you. But there is a way how to leverage that option. Uh, what I really like about uh, Bitcoin and hardware wallets and seats in general is they at least give you a lot of options you can choose from. Mm -hmm. But if you are unbanked, there, there, there are no options for you. Well, and that's the option of like, you know, you take a stack of bills and you put them in your boot. Like, put, the money goes in your sock. Like, we, we're, it's like, when we circle the drain on these problems, sometimes we come back to just being like, oh yeah, we invented that, it's called cash. Like, uh, you won't lose it if you take yeah. care of it. So, I, I mean, uh, that's just my editorialization on that. But you're right, I mean, there, there are options. Yeah. And I suppose over time, we see what works, what catches on. So let's get back then, though, yeah. to the, the core ideology of self um, custodianship, like you need to have these keys yourself. I guess that like exists in other things as well. Like, do, is there anything else where we don't mediate like our really important stuff to someone else? Because like security has never really been about complete self-reliance. There's always community in some way involved with security. And we might say the community of like traditional banking is corrupt and we hate it. But like, is there any anything in the community of like, listen, I'm going to obviously lose my key at some point, so let's create some collective organization where we can hold these things together so that none of us get screwed. I'm just speaking from the hip here. I have no idea if this exists. I think there are definitely a lot of examples of um, like community uh, security, um, maybe not particularly with when it comes to like monetary things, but I think that like collective and community security is definitely something that a lot of uh, like cultures and places have taken on. Yeah. Um, you know, there are uh, autonomous communities in Mexico, um, in Oaxaca. There are like various uh, places around the world where people have taken on sort of a collective responsibility. Um, infrastructure, like internet infrastructure. Also, there are community Wi-Fi networks. Um, here in New York, we have a, a mesh network that is collectively uh, collectively operated by a team that kind of just goes around installing mesh nodes uh, to create like sort of a, like a mesh network that is kind of like a backup and also provides access to like the main internet. Mm -hmm. So I think like, yeah, for, with, with any one of these technical problems, I think there are ways to kind of collectivize it where you're not relying on a centralized authority, but you are still sort of splitting responsibility among like a system of like trusted peers. And in a way, that's kind of like what the the, the blockchain is also in, in a sense, because like you're basically like everyone is confirming that like the that the ledger is the way that it is. And like by that, that consensus, that sort of consensus governing, that's how the whole system works. In the same way, I think like 
yeah, maybe like if there was a if there was like a hardware wallet or something that required multiple people in order to like confirm the sort of like ownership of it, that that's something that could probably easily be implemented. But I think that like yeah, I think with with especially when it comes to cryptocurrency, there's a huge tend towards individualism, which I'm not particularly fond of. Like I understand the need to like like secure your own like what's yours, um, but I think that like finding ways to take these systems and sort of collectivize them in a way that like breeds more sort of like community collaboration, small scale, that doesn't involve like a government or state entity, but nevertheless gives like collectivized control over resources is always like an important thing to pursue. And I bring that up because it's like the reason that governments exist today in the Western nation state kind of method comes from like a king and a king was just like the strongest person in that region who defeated everyone else and then built the biggest castle. So it's like, there's, uh, and I can see the crypto space being kind of the same thing. Like the people who have the biggest amount of crypto building the most secure castle around it and then thereby being the ones who can control more and more. Like, so we talk about lost Bitcoin and it reveals this odd wrinkle to the technology at its first instance, which is the private key. And then we talk about the ways that we can mitigate that risk for the good of the ideological stuff. But sometimes I kind of feel like, hey, if we mitigate the risk in a way that replicates the old system, then we're just, uh, you know, recreating the world with bits instead of blocks, you know? Yeah, that's bricks. always... Bits instead of bricks, that's better. <laughs> Yeah, that's always the concern is like, you know, whenever any technology is being designed, and this is like what I always say to people is like, it's it's always important to ask the question like, what, who is this ultimately benefiting? Like, who is this being designed for? Um, because if what you're doing is kind of just replicating the old monetary system in a digital form, like if that's what you're doing, then you're just gonna end up with the same thing except digital. And that's what I was saying before about how people who are already wealthy have, already there are many examples like wealthy people have already like fully exploited the, the the bitcoin system in order to continue doing the thing that they do best which is taking money and turning it into more money and then having it and hoarding it all for themselves so that's like that's always the challenge right it's like to uh, ask yourself that question so that during the design process when you're designing new tools to make sure that people who are disadvantaged are being designed for and not the people who already have these resources. Pavel, you're designing a, a hardware wallet. Are you taking these considerations into account as you guys are doing it? Yes, of course. That's something I, I think a lot about. And I still do believe that uh, Bitcoin is as fair as it could be because it, it has an anonymous founder. Uh, the emission of new coins is well known and is, isn't going to change. And that's not true for most of the other coins that we, we see nowadays. There are either changing the rules, uh, how the new coins are minted, or they are uh, trying to implement a system that's called proof of stake, which basically means that the more coins you own, the more you are able to dictate the rules on, on the network. And this is something uh, that I'm not really, really fond of. And maybe there is a way how to turn that kind of technology, and I mean proof of stake, into something that will not uh, end up enriching already the rich. But I think Bitcoin has much better shot and, at this goal. And we can also speculate there are a lot of uh, early adopters of Bitcoin who are uh, filthy rich, but at the same time, I really do hope their intentions are better because they come from the IT sphere so it's <laughs> a little your bit people yeah, i get that i would say uh, but here's a, it's like <laughs> yeah. do you trust like <laughs> who's going to who's going to save us is it davos or is it like the bitcoin bros you know that that in my most yeah. um, in my most uh, <laughs> cynical world when i think about this stuff i'm like oh crap those are two bad options <laughs> yeah it's neither it's it's i i think like it's good that some of these tools exist and i always like i think like having the option is always good um, specifically like what we were talking about before in terms of like, you know, the unbanked uh, vulnerable populations that perhaps didn't have any access before, at least now have the possibility of achieving something. However, I think that, you know, fundamentally, we still live under a, a system of capitalism and we that there are certain 
things that are going to be replicated in whatever tools that we create under that system. And so it really takes a lot of effort to design things in a way that is not going to replicate the same problems and the same uh, challenges that we had before. I have a blue sky concept here, which is like, in trying to solve the problem of the private key and making a secure yet accessible way and system for people to have it and not lose it, is it also kind of like backing into trying to solve some of the problems of just digital identity writ large? Which is to say, like, these days, our identity is so much often verified by way of, like, biometrics, like, you know, our eye irises or our fingerprints or maybe one day our DNA, things that, like, I might think of as, like, a little intrusive. But in trying to solve this problem, is there a way that we're backing into thinking about digital identity and verification through hardware wallet kind of solutions? I don't know. Maybe I'm taking too much acid here, but like that, that's, that's what uh, the, the concept of digital identity and how you verify it, is that a use case for the kind of technology that you're, you're developing with a, with a hardware wallet? Yeah, I, I can totally see the future uh, that can in, evolve into that. I mean, there are already cases where we already use digital identities. For example, in Estonia, you can participate in uh, in election just by using your ID card, which has embedded chip inside. Mm -hmm. and that's already a digital identity. It's uh, it's issued by the government, but it is fully digital. And there are already some nice properties. Like, for example, you can, uh, you can check that your vote has been counted. And at the same time, you are not revealing who you voted for. And that's, uh, that's, that's already, already good. And uh, there are also some other ideas how to implement these digital identities in the centralized manner. There, are, there is a work group uh, in Microsoft that's called DID. The centralized identity, and they are trying to leverage uh, Bitcoin as uh, as a root of trust uh, for these digital identities. So there is definitely a lot of uh, interesting development uh, in there. But what I wanted to say is that these are all the tools, and it only depends on people how we are going to to use them. And Jenny's mentioned earlier that we are living in the world of capitalism, and that might be true for the US and the Western Europe, but there are countries that are uh, not driven by capitalism and they still might benefit somehow somehow from, from Bitcoin. Yeah, well, no, and I think that the idea of digital identity is kind of interesting because like, what is a key but a way of saying, this is me and I have access to this? So yeah, that's kind of the whole idea behind like having the, you know, the private key like we were talking about is like that is a, a thing that you possess and possession of that thing is all that's needed. You don't need to give your fingerprints or your iris scan or your biometric identifiers. And like, yeah, it's again, it's all about how it's implemented, though, because like, you know, there are various examples of like governments using biometrics as like a form of identification. And so what really matters is who is who is who, if anyone, is the custodian of that system, and who is implementing it, and how are they implementing it? Yeah, I think I, I'm. I'm really excited that we backed into like this idea because like the surveillance state as it exists in the world today, like sort of functions on a cross-referencing on so, of so many different data points, including biometrics, including like you know your credit history, including your physical address that's on your gas bill, and like if if through the somewhat like schadenfreude hilarity of losing a bunch of Bitcoin, like the awesome geeks of the world can figure out how to like make identity something that you actually own and isn't something that is given to you by a government, like we're in really great shape because that, that's like a fundamental issue. And that's a, that, that, like that, that folds out into so many different things about how the worth of a person can be recognized. What, what I really like about the concept of digital identities is that it allows you to own more than one identity because usually when you have an ID then you are using the same identity for whatever use case. Mm -hmm. You are showing that uh, at, at the gas station, you are showing that to, to, to at the election and these can be used against you for example, but with digital identities, you can have as many as you want and they really didn't need to be linkable. 
and this allows us for uh, for for us to create uh, pseudonymous uh, identities. And I think there are a lot of use cases where the operator of the service don't really know, don't, don't really need to to know your true identity. They just has to know this is user number 17 that has returned uh, and I need to show him their data and not the data of somebody else. And this is also very, very exciting. I, anytime anyone says multiple identity stuff, though, I, I just go to like, oh, cool. So another way of shit, shit posting without getting any of the, the like blowback or consequences. But yes, I see what you, there are legitimate use cases for that as well. Um, well, we got to a lot of different places from just a bunch of people losing their Bitcoin. And so I'm thankful to both of you for, for talking through this because it is very technically kind of difficult for me to understand, but the implications are huge. One last question, though, like, why aren't there a bunch of people who are treasure hunters that are just trying to find, you know, using a computer program or whatever, the keys that are missing, like randomly generating them, and then, you know, just brute force to try to find it. Like, in the same way that, you know, on the beach, you see guys with, uh, with beachcomber metal detectors. Are there beachcombers for Bitcoin? I think they are, but the chance they found something is really, really small. Like when when, uh, when you recall how I said earlier that the private key is a really huge number, it's uh, it's uh, really the, the astronomical numbers we are talking about. Yeah, this is like, this is a very speculative problem because like, you know, maybe sometime in the future we'll have quantum computers that can, you know, compute on a, on a factor, on a scale that we cannot even comprehend of right now. But currently in the, in the world that we live in, um, and, you know, and maybe in the future there will be a different system that will account for that. But, like, in the world that we live in right now, it's basically effectively impossible because the amount of resources it would take is just astronomical and can't be done practically. You need more energy than in the known universe? <laughs> that's crazy. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know if that's... I'm not sure because I've never heard that before. I've but never I, heard I, it I would believe it. I, I love it, yeah. <laughs> So basically, if you're able to solve this problem with that energy, maybe use it for something else. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I wanted to add one thing. Uh, a good thing about Bitcoin is there are a lot of coins owned by Satoshi. So if there was an attacker like this, they would probably go after these coins first. And if they moved them, then we would know. And hopefully we still have a lot of time to move our coins to some better algorithm or something like that. Well, you know, I'm it actually really hearing that the, the coins that Satoshi owns are actually considered lost as well. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, we don't know who he was. He might as well be dead and he m might not have the keys even he, if he's alive. So for what it's worth, we are considering these coins as to be lost. At the same time, they are really, really nice honeypot for uh, attackers to look into because there is a huge stash of coins there just then, very, waiting to be... Yeah, the stupid question, but like, what happens to all those Bitcoins? They just like sit on the ledger and they don't move around. Pretty much. Exactly. They sit around, and I'm not an economist either, but I think it's the second option you mentioned. Like there, it's, it's, it's an anchor that we can, uh, we can consider safe. And at the same time, this is increasing the value of the other coins that are still in the circulation. So, yeah. So no one really wants to ask some economy. Yeah, no one wants to find them because if they do, it might be, it might throw the whole system whack. There's I mean, many reasons. If somebody tweets something weird, it could upset the whole system too. So That's a good point. there are various factors that could make it go up and down. And like at this point, I feel like we've gotten used to the fact that Bitcoin and other systems are just very unstable, and mm -hmm. like there that that is just kind of the nature of it. And you know, from for various reasons. But it's kind of like romantic to think about in the same way that they're like gold doubloons, like you know, buried under X on the map. That there are just all these lost Bitcoins waiting they're to... They're also fake. They're... Everything's fake. Money is fake. Oh, right. It doesn't... It, <laughs> they're of no value because they don't do anything. <laughs> it's all made up. It's not real coins. Nothing's real. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> and actually, we know exactly where they are, right? Because they're on a blockchain. And so it's written where they are. It's just you can't get in. It's like... I knocked on the table. And nobody's there to answer the door. <laughs>